A very warm welcome to everyone assembled here this morning. We are delighted to see so many people at 10 a.m. on a working day. I hope it's not further proof of the mounting unemployment that Mr. Modi's government has given us. But I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Lovely to see you all here, and thank you for showing up in such large numbers. Um, when I first conceived the idea of this festival, as the Member of Parliament from Tiruvannantapuram, and spoke to uh, uh, my good friend Shreyams Kumar and his father, the legendary Virendra Kumar, who run the Madhurumi, that they would be the ideal people to take it on, I must say, and I think they will agree with me, that uh, we never expected such a grand success. Uh, last year, we had three days that were jam-packed. The support given by book-loving friends like you, who turned up in very, very large numbers, has encouraged the festival to add a fourth day. So this year, we are four days. We had always planned to do it over the first weekend in February, but we're beginning, as you can see today, on the 31st of January, and we are very, very privileged to be in not just the capital of Kerala, but arguably the city that this weekend is the capital of culture for all of us in India. Thank you all for being here. And as patron, let me say, what a privilege it is to open this festival with the inaugural address in the presence of such a full house. Um, Niti was kind enough to remind me of my quote-unquote diplomatic past. I was actually uh, an international civil servant not neither international nor civil nor a servant, as Jawaharlal Nehru might have said, uh, at the United Nations for almost 29 years. Um, but, um, but indeed, um, uh, one was obliged to be a little more diplomatic there than one is in one's uh, political life. So I assure you that any thought of diplomatic uh, vocabulary or conversation may be banished forthwith. I intend to be very blunt today. And for those of you standing at the back, there are still some seats in front and a few scattered in between. So do come. There are at least three or four seats available unless you're standing there strategically poised for an early exit. Uh, like the Indian cricket team, which has caused a bit of pall of darkness to settle on, settle on me this morning. Um, the theme that the organizers suggested was era of darkness then and now. And as you all know, it's uh, a reference the, to the title of my 2016 book, An Era of Darkness, which was published internationally as Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India, uh, which uh, uh, tells you what it was about. It was a, a book that looked at the 200 years of British colonialism, not as a narrative history, but as an argument, as a sustained argument, uh, which laid out what the British had done in the course of these couple of centuries that we could look back upon uh, and, and formulate a judgment about. And my judgment was uncompromisingly critical. It starts with the basic facts that India was a country which in 1700 accounted for 27% of global GDP, the richest country in the world, the revenues of the then emperor, Aurangzeb, exceeded the revenues of every single crowned head in Europe combined, including Louis in his grand palace in Versailles and the Queen in Buckingham Palace. It was an enormously uh, wealthy, prosperous, thriving society with uh, a very sophisticated civilization, the world's leading exporter of textiles since the days of the Roman Empire, one can find uh, debates in the Roman Senate recorded by Pliny the Elder that speak of how most of the gold of Rome is sitting in India because of the taste of Roman women for fine Indian textiles, muslins, and linens. You can find accounts in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century uh, from England of British shopkeepers trying to pass off shoddily made European cloth is made in India because made in India was the hallmark of global quality. Uh, so the world's leading export of textiles, a sophisticated economy with a banking system that dwarfed the Bank of England run in private hands, the Jagat Sates and others like that. Uh, you had uh, weavers, you had merchants, you had uh, a, a thriving steel industry with a technology uh, that had been borrowed by the Arabs to make the famous Damascus steel. 
You had shipbuilding that was the envy of the world because at a time when most European ships lasted barely six or seven years, they were made of fur or pine and disintegrated in the water over time, Indian ships made of Indian teak or mahogany and with extremely high quality brass work and fittings would last an average of 23, 22 years. And, and Indian ships were the envy of the world. You look around and you see this extraordinary civilization and then you see 200 years of loot, rapine and plunder by the British that reduced India to a poster child for third world poverty by the time they left in that first ignominious Brexit of 1947 when they left India uh, having at that point 90% of the population below the poverty line when the British left. Uh, 35 million people having died totally unnecessary deaths in British created and administered famines, which India had no experience of before because we had a, a different culture of dealing with droughts, uh, uh, including charity that was explicitly prohibited by the British. You had uh, rapacious taxation uh, that created an onerous burden on the Indian peasantry. The creation of a landless peasantry for the first time in recorded history. You have a series of uh, atrocities being committed, culminating in the notorious Jallianwala Bagh massacre, whose centenary is approaching in three months' time on the 13th of April. So you look back on this record and you see horrors that um, in many, many ways must be said were pointed out at the time by British people of, of conscience. Uh, and, and so a lot of the evidence I've used and cited comes from House of Commons testimony, uh, the trial of Warren Hastings in the 1780s, the, uh, the hearings, various select committee hearings in the House of Commons right up to the 1850s. Uh, and, and so a lot, of, a lot of information that's available from British sources to damn their record uh, in, in our eyes. What is the counter-argument? The counter-argument is, yes, 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 all this happened, but it was par for the course in those days. No empire was better. The Belgians were a lot worse than the Congo. So come on, you know, look at all the wonderful things the British did. They left you the railways, rule of law, uh, courts, the English language, tea, and of course, cricket. Uh, so how can you possibly be ungrateful to them? You are a democracy because of the British. To which the book is a sustained riposte that argues that none of these things was a gift of the British, that in every single case without exception, the institutions being thus praised were in fact institutions put into India for the benefit only of the British to enhance British control, to extend British power, and to of course multiply British profits. The British were here to do well, not to do good. They were here to make as much, as much money as they could. And as was uh, dramatically revealed as late as the 1920s by a British Home Secretary at the time in closed door testimony, he said there is a lot of cant about us being here for the good of the Indians. This is complete nonsense. We seize India by the sword, we hold it by the yardstick, and we shall continue to do so for our benefit. This was as stark a statement as has ever been made of the way in which the British actually ran the country. And if I were to give you a few examples of why these seemingly wonderful gifts to India were not what, uh, what the British and their apologists like to make them out to be, let's take the railways. That's everybody's favorite example. At least we have the railways. You know, Mussolini used to say, at least the trains ran on time. Uh, so let me tell you about the railways. The railways were a gigantic colonial scam. They were brought in, first of all, very sp specifically minuted by the Governor General of the time for two purposes. One, to extract resources from the interior of the country and take them to the ports to be shipped to England. The English were already stripping India bare in the coastal towns in order to, to send both money and goods to England. They thought they could do this from the interior if they had trains as well. And second, to be able to send troops into the interior to quell any unrest or any disturbance. Secondly, the railways were built entirely with Indian taxpayers' money, and the profits went entirely to the British investor. So investing in the Indian railways was the single most profitable investment available 
in London from the mid-1840s to the mid-1870s because there was a guaranteed rate of return. Have you ever heard of an investment with a guaranteed rate of return that was double that of the highest indexed treasury securities? On top of which, the British spent money left, right, and center because it wasn't their money. So each mile, each kilometer of Indian railway cost nine times what the same kilometer or mile was costing at the same time in the USA or Canada. That was how the railways were built. They were also run as a totally racist enterprise, which completely excluded Indians from any position of responsibility, from station master to ticket collector, let alone chairman of the railway board. Uh, indeed, it was a monopoly of young white men till the First World War gave the world a shortage of young white men, whereupon the British looked around for those who came closest and started hiring a few Anglo-Indians or Eurasians, as, as uh, others will understand them today. Uh, and it was a very, very, um, uh, I mean, it, literally your job applications were classified according to your race uh, and your salary perks and benefits as well. Now, that's just one example. And to add to that is the fact that when um, the railways were built, as I said, for these British purposes, naturally, Indians started wanting to clamber onto these iron uh, uh, trains as well. So they decided to add these awful passenger wagons with wooden slats for benches on which Indians could ride. Uh, they proceeded to charge Indians the highest passenger rates in the world for any railway at the time, while charging British companies the lowest freight rates in the world for the freight that they were shipping. Um, that's for the railways. As for rule of law, the rule of law was administered with excessive attention to the skin color of the defendant. Um, when Indians so much as raised a hand against an Englishman, uh, they were either hanged, blown from the mouths of cannons, or shipped off for lifetime transportation to a penal colony. In the early 1820s and 30s, it used to be places like Singapore, which were built entirely by Indian prison labor, uh, and uh, later the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, were just uh, essentially penal colonies for Indians who had misbehaved with the British. Whereas when English people killed Indians, they got off with either no punishment, a light fine, or a few days imprisonment. Uh, the most popular form uh, of this, uh, the most popular reason for Indians being killed by English people was being kicked to death by an employer, usually in a drunken state. Well, the British rationalized this by saying that um, all Indians were malarial, therefore they had swollen spleens, and therefore when they were kicked, they died of a ruptured spleen, not really of any assault by, uh, by the English. And there was an entire jurisprudence about this. So in the entire 200 years of British rule, there are only eight English people who were ever convicted of murdering Indians, and this was in three separate cases. One case involved four or five drunken soldiers who murdered some people. But the fact is that eight people in 200 years, uh, and of course a rule under which no Indian judge could, could try a white person and so on, made it very clear what rule of law was worth to the British. Now, I don't want to go into detail on every single example, but it's all there. Uh, but T might raise some of our curiosity, since that's supposed to be a great gift of the British. Let me say the British grew tea in India, but for the British. They used to buy tea from China. It was extremely expensive. It was a luxury item in Britain. Uh, they did think from the 1820s onwards, we're ruling India, why can't we grow tea here? So they sent off a secret agent with the improbable name, it's absolutely true though, of Robert Fortune to go off and steal tea bushes from China and bring those tea bushes back to India. But the poor tea bushes kept dying on the way. So Robert Fortune's espionage was completely useless until a wandering Scotsman came across something in Assam that looked suspiciously like a tea bush growing wild. He tested it and found, yes, indeed, it was tea. And what is more, tea of a much more robust color and taste than the Chinese teas, which are very pale and, and fragrant, but, but not particularly robust. And so that's how they decided to cultivate tea in India. But from the 1840s to the 1930s, it was grown purely for export to Britain, with a very tiny percentage being kept in India for the British in India. It was only with the Great Depression, when the bottom fell out of the market, 
and the British housewife could no longer afford to buy imported tea from India, that the British were forced to open to find an Indian market for the vast quantities of surplus tea they had. And it's with that that you see the dramatic expansion of tea, con tea consumption in India. It's as little as 90 years ago, or not even 90, uh, 80 odd years ago, that we got, we became a nation of tea drinkers everywhere. And finally, uh, uh, since uh, cricket, unfortunately, has turned around and given us a kick in the pants today uh, against the New Zealanders, let me just say that the best word about cricket, which I must say I can't find anything negative to say about the British on, on having introduced that princely sport to our country, uh, I will say, however, that the best word was said by the sociologist Ashish Nandi, who wrote rather memorably, looking at the game and how it's played, its rules, its traditions, he said, cricket is actually an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> now, I, I left out two illustrations of that era of darkness, which I should go on slightly more detail about. Uh, I mean, I mentioned one, I mentioned them both very briefly, but didn't expatiate on them. One, of course, was the famines, because many people have been given by the British the impression that famines are somehow endemic to India, and the British did their best to alleviate them. The opposite is true. In the past, when droughts occurred, India had this very reflexively humane system where taxes on the peasantry were waived or postponed, where everyone gave charity. We had a long culture of mendicants going with begging bowls from door to door, even in the best of times. Um, that's part of the, the culture of the, of the society and essentially vast amounts of charity were admitted no one was allowed to starve. When the British came, they followed four principles. Number one, charity and idleness are bad. Char charity breeds idleness and idleness should not be permitted, therefore charity is banned. I'm not joking, it seems improbable today, but it was true of the 18th and early 19th century Britain. Number two, the uh, Adam Smithian principle that the um, uh, free market should be allowed to operate, which means that even in a drought prone area, if the available grain is being bought up by the British to be shipped off to England for the bread baskets of London, and therefore becomes completely unaffordable for the local population, too bad. Those are the basic laws of economics. Three, the Malthusian principle. The Malthus's theory was very popular in the late 18th century onwards, which said basically that if a land cannot sustain the population that is trying to live off it, then people must die. It's as simple as that. And that was fully accepted. And the fourth principle was one of Victorian fiscal prudence, which is that thou shall not spend money that thou hast not budgeted. And since thou will never budget for a famine, thou will not spend any existing money from the budget for that purpose. The result was that when famines occurred, number one, charity was disallowed. So much so, I've recorded an instance during the Orissa famines of 1866, when a Mr. McMinn, moved by the distress he saw around him, started giving food to starving Indians. He was not only forbidden to do so, but threatened with deportation by the British authorities. Uh, poor Mr. McMinn uh, then had to stop. You have, um, you have uh, therefore, no charity being permitted, either by Indians and, of course, not done by the Brits. And then you had, of course, uh, on top of everything else, vast purchases of grain because the purpose of exploiting Indian agriculture was to, to fill the bread baskets of England, and therefore there was no question of stopping that, which again, whatever little grain was left became unaffordable to the Indian peasant. And at the same time, there was a heartlessness about debts as being inevitable and not their concern that went along with it. So right up to, uh, uh, from the beginning of British rule to the mid 19th century, there were millions of Indians who died. In fact, the province of Bengal suffered a famine in the 1770s in which one third of the entire population, six million people died, uh, in, in, and, and the British were just completely indifferent to it. There had been no record in history of anything comparable in the experience of Bengal. It was thanks to the British. By the mid-19th century, however, the British had begun to develop a conscience. They had a free press, a growing democracy. People were talking much more openly about how could this be allowed to happen. The same thing, the same opposition to charity was being challenged within Britain, of course. Dickens is writing about the poor houses, uh, all of this concern about how um, British culture had treated the poor. 
and the starving, the destitute. And therefore, you ended up with a different language. Now, all these things remained true and remained documented and ministered, but the British felt obliged to provide some sort of relief. So they would set up these work camps where the starving people would be fed in exchange for rigorous, hard labor. But how much were they fed? The British historian Mike Davies has estimated that the food given in these work camps was actually less than the rations provided by the Nazis to the Jews who were sentenced to death in the Buchenwald concentration camp. So people who were being prepared for the gas chambers were given more generous rations than the people who had to go out and expend uh, their energies in doing work for the British from those camps. So that was the kind of British idea of charity um, that, that went on during the famines. As I said, 35 million people died. The last example of this came during the Second World War when you had the Great Bengal Famine of 1943-44. What happened at that time was that uh, there was a big drought in Bengal. For all these reasons, the famine again began. What the British did at that point was um, to continue to ship food uh, and grain from Bengal to Europe. Um, uh, the British officials in Calcutta started sending messages to London saying, there's a problem here. People are literally dropping dead in the fields and on the streets. Uh, the reply from Winston Churchill the Prime Minister was completely unsympathetic. He ordered that shipments of Australian wheat on their way to Europe, which could have easily docked in Calcutta and unloaded them, uh, would have to sail on to Europe because he said the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis matters much less than that of sturdy Greeks. What he meant was that he wanted to have buffer stocks created in Greece in the possibility of a future likely invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia by the Allies. He wanted grain available for that purpose. So starving Bengalis today were less important than possible future meals in the event of a future invasion of the Allies uh, to countries still under German occupation. Uh, on top of that, of course, it was accompanied by the typical Chechilian invective. I hate Indians anyway. They're a beastly people with a beastly religion, he said. Uh, when he was told of the numbers, the death toll was mounting into the millions, he said it's all their fault anyway for breeding like rabbits. And these are all exact quotes from Churchill, not one word changed. And when finally the, the figure crossed 4.3 million and conscience-stricken officials were sending desperate telegrams to Churchill beseeching him to act and stop this, uh, this basic genocide that was going on, Churchill wrote on the margin of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? And this is the man whom the British expect us to hail as some sort of apostle of freedom and democracy when he was easily one of the more odious uh, mass murderers of the 20th century. So this is the era of darkness that the famine gave us. And uh, the culmination, as you like, the symbol of the worst of these atrocities, a lot of this involved indirect deaths, exploitation, rape, and loot. But in the case of Jallianwala Bagh, there was a direct massacre. It happened at the end of the First World War, which in case any of you have forgotten, India supported the British effort. Mahatma Gandhi, no less, called for India to support the British in the First World War. We actually had, during the First World War, over a million Indian men under arms serving uh, in various theaters of the First World War. It was Indian soldiers diverted from routine duty in North Africa who were sent off to France and Belgium who actually saved uh, those countries at the beginning of the war through exemplary heroism in Ypres and the Battle of Flanders. They ended up, in fact, winning 11 Victoria Crosses, the highest, highest awards for gallantry available to any soldier uh, in the British Army. And, uh, and this, this extraordinary performance was accompanied by a drain of resources that India could ill afford. India had already been reduced to a pretty poor country by then. It was already a country in which in which people were starving, malnourishment was up, and yet we send the equivalent in today's money of 80 billion, that's with a B, pounds sterling in cash and, 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 and uh, money. We send material, we send clothing, uniforms, we send carts, vehicles, pack animals, and we sent even rail lines ripped out of the ground from India and sent to aid the transport of British troops. 
This is what the, the war effort was all about. And uh, in exchange, the Indians hoped that they would get uh, responsible self-government. That is, the expectation was that in exchange for all these sacrifices and support, 75,000 Indians were killed, by the way, and another 75,000 or so massively injured, that um, dominion status, which is the status enjoyed by the white commonwealth, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, had a status where the British remained nominally in charge, but the institutions of government were actually run by locals. Uh, the governor general was a symbol of the crown, and then the prime minister and the, the ministers were all locals, and that's what India thought India would get as their reward at the end of the war. But perfidious Albion, of course, of course broke its word. None of this was actually done. We had the, the, the absolutely namby-pamby Montague Chelmsford reforms that gave no real power over anything to any Indians. Uh, there was no attempt at creating any responsible Indian government. And instead, there was the Rowlett Acts, a reimposition of the wartime era restrictions on freedom of press, freedom of, the, of assembly, of gatherings, and it was extremely rigorous and repressive legislation. At this point, protests erupted throughout British India. Some of the most vocal were in Punjab, where um, protest meetings were held, by and large non-violent, though there were occasional stray incidents, and the British immediately clamped down, arrested the major Congress leaders who were addressing these protests, and, um, and at that time, they also, um, in effect, declared martial law. They didn't call it that, but they sent soldiers and generals to each of the restive parts of British India to keep law and order. Brigadier General Reginald Dyer was sent to Amritsar, the, the, the principal town in eastern Punjab. Well, not principal, Lahore would have been, but Amritsar was, was full of unrest. And uh, he came in, clamped down what today we know as Section 144, restricted the gathering of people, uh, shut down various uh, movements. Essentially, it was a, a tight, tight restriction. Unfortunately for him, there were a number of Indians who gathered on Baisakhi Day, Baisakhi is a kind of spring festival uh, in Punjab, and many of the people who came were peasants from surrounding areas, as well as some, some from the city itself, who were unaware, uh, for the most part, that their gathering to celebrate Baisakhi was not allowed. When Dyer got reports of a large number of Indians who'd gathered in a walled enclosure, Jalianwala Bagh, he didn't bother to find out why they were there or what they were doing. Uh, they were, in fact, unarmed. There were men, women, and children. Uh, it was just a peaceful gathering. He just immediately ordered a detachment of soldiers to accompany him, went to the Bagh, essentially lined them up at the wall near the gate, the only means of egress from the, from the Bagh, and coldly, clinically opened fire. When you hear the word massacre, you think of the heat and dust of battle and and, and, and you know the, 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 the charging of clashing of sabers and the charging of bullets. None of that. It was just cold, mechanical precision. The only screaming and wailing were from the poor men, women, and children who didn't know what was happening, who faced this murderous fusillade of bullets and started screaming and running helter-skelter. As they ran towards the, the gate, they were even easier targets, as Dyer himself boasted later to an inquiry commission. <coughs> 1,379 people were killed. I beg your pardon, 379 by British figures, 1,379 Indian figures, um, a total of 1,600 bullets were fired, 1,600 rounds of ammunition, uh, and obviously a very, very large percentage either killed or wounded someone. Practically no bullets missed their mark. Again, something that Dyer noted with grim satisfaction when he testified. And the worst thing about all of this was not just the killing, which is bad enough, but what happened afterwards. He barred the gates and would not allow either his soldiers or relatives to offer any succor to the wounded and the dying. For 24 hours, they lay baking in the hot sun, moaning for help. You had a road nearby where an English missionary had been assaulted, though she'd also been rescued by Indians, where Dyer insisted that all Indians should have to crawl on that road on their bellies. They had to crawl on that road if they wanted to walk past that road, and if not, they would be beaten on their head with British staves, uh, and many were. On top of all of that, he imposed further restrictions and humiliations, uh, locked up young men in cages in the open sun, did all sorts of things. And when there was a popular outcry and the Congress party conducted an inquiry and so on, 
The official commission of inquiry, the Hunter Commission, was very generous to Dyer, accepting pretty much all of his excuses. Uh, he was given, uh, a, 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 however, a censure by the House of Commons, and Brigadier had been a temporary promotion, so he was demoted back to Colonel, and essentially cashiered, but thereupon the House of Lords passed a resolution praising him, and the British started a collection to reward him for what he had done, with a leading light being that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, Rudyard Kipling, who hailed him as the man who saved India. And they raised the princely sum of over a quarter of a million pounds sterling, which is like about uh, 25 million pounds in today's money, which is presented to him with a bejeweled sword. And this money was given to him for his great deed in saving the British Empire by shooting down a large number of unarmed, defenseless, innocent people. So that was essentially the story of Jallianwala Bagh. It epitomized in many ways everything that was wrong about the Raj. The exploitation of the Indians when the British needed them for the First World War, the betrayal of promises made or implied in return, the uh, action of violent cruelty and atrocity that followed, the justification and the racism that accompanied it and the subsequent treatment, and finally, the exoneration in British public opinion all of this put together makes Jallianwala Bagh perhaps the symbol of the worst that the British Empire could be. And what's striking is, of course, it's not the numbers, because we either number, either the Indian number or the British number, is trivial by comparison with many other British massacres. For example, when the British retook Delhi after the revolt or mutiny of 1857, in 1858 they butchered 100,000 Indians in Delhi, civilians in Delhi alone. So, 1,300, whatever we claim, is actually a very small figure, but it's the overall symbolic effect that makes this so bad. And so I'll conclude this part of the era of darkness story by saying that there is a ripe opportunity for the British to undo uh, some of the stains, some of the scars they left behind with their conduct for 200 years by taking the opportunity of the centenary on the 13th of April to have someone, it probably won't be somebody from this beleaguered government which barely knows if it's going to survive, but maybe a member of the, of the royal family could come because everything was done in the name of the crown and go on bended knee as Willie Brown did in the Warsaw Ghetto and just apologize on behalf of the British nation, the British people for what had been done to India during those 200 years of criminal exploitation. And when I say criminal exploitation, uh, the American historian Will Durant, who wrote that famous 11-volume history of human civilization, described British rule in India as the worst crime in all humanity. He was writing before Hitler and Mao and Stalin. So let us say, as of up to 1930, he felt it was the worst crime in all human history. That's how bad people of conscience judge the British rule to have been. Now, that was the era of darkness then, and I'll spend somewhat less time on the era of darkness now because you're all living it and you know what I'm talking about. I am not comparing the present rule of the BJP government to British rule in India. There are vast differences and nothing quite compares to 200 years of colonial exploitation. But I am accusing our present government of imposing a different kind of darkness on India at a time when the lights had shone far more brightly than they ever did under British rule. In 70 years, India had built up a thriving democracy with a free press, with responsible, autonomous, and independent institutions, with a thriving culture of dissent, a strong civil society featuring non-governmental organizations agitating for human rights, for bonded laborers, uh, uh, fighting against age-old iniquities from untouchability, to other prohibitions, a social revolution taking place in many ways in this country, where, for example, a, a Dalit woman, a category from which it, was, it would have been impossible to imagine anyone ruling the Indo-Gangetic plain for 3,000 years, the land of Aryavran, has been chief minister of UP three times. So all of these extraordinary transformations in a very positive democratic way had been happening for 70 years. And I would even say, that the victory in an election in 2014 of a person who had risen from very humble origins to the most powerful office in the land 
was itself an affirmation of the democracy and the society that had been built in India uh, over the, well, actually 67 years to that point. Uh, am I right? You got my maths right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when, when, when this government came to power. But unfortunately, in the five years that have followed, a different kind of darkness has settled on the land. It consists of a number of interlocking and interrelated challenges. But it, at the heart of it goes the assumption that the, ruling the, that the prime minister is the ruling party, that the ruling party is the government, and the government is the nation. So that opposition to the prime minister is tantamount to being anti-national. Starting off with that premise, you have self-righteousness, delegitimization of dissent. You have an extraordinary series of actions ranging, ranging from the imposition of governmental fiats on university campuses to the sedition charges levied against nonviolent human rights activists as recently as a month ago to a situation in which the standard answer from government ministers to criticism is, why don't you go to Pakistan? If you want to send your critics far away, why not suggest Canada? But no, you have to suggest Pakistan because there is a message there that the only critics of this government must be either Muslim or Muslim lovers, and that in turn translates in their line, in their worldview, to being anti-national. On top of that, you've seen a series of atrocities. You've seen human beings being assaulted and even murdered in the name of cow protection. We've had an extreme a series of, of, of tragedies that are, are difficult to describe except in terms of darkness. The father of an Air Force Havilda beaten to death outside his own home on suspicion that the meat he was carrying in his bag was beef. It was not, but even if it was, that are grounds for mass murder for murder. And then the mob breaks down his front door, ransacks his kitchen, breaks his fridge, takes the meat within to a police station, and instead of arresting them for the crime they have just committed, the police arrest the meat, and they send it off to a lab to be tested to see if it was indeed beef. And of course it wasn't, but again, that shows you what has happened uh, to our country. When we created, out of the extraordinary nonviolent freedom struggle, a country, we gave ourselves a constitution, and that constitution reflected one side of the divergence in the nationalist movement. The nationalist movement against the British, as we know, splintered two ways. Thanks to the British policy of divide and rule, we had encouragement finance given to, the, to those who argued that Muslims represented a separate interest in this country. And they argued, therefore, that religion should be a determinant of nationhood uh, and the, a separate country should be created for Muslims. Thanks to a great deal of British help and abetment on the way, they succeeded, and that was the idea of Pakistan. But the rest of the nationalist movement, the vast majority of it, never accepted the logic that had divided the country. They never said that because partition has created a country for Muslims, what remains is a country for Hindus. On the contrary, Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Azad, the whole lot of those giants said that what remains, on the contrary, is the real India. We fought for freedom for everyone and we will preserve freedom for everyone. And they wrote a constitution for the idea that we can endure differences of caste, of creed, of color, of culture, of cuisine, of conviction, of consonant, of costume and custom. Because we still will rally around a consensus and that consensus is the constitutional consensus that in a large, diverse democracy like ours, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of upon what and how you will disagree. What we are facing today is for the first time a government that does not accept those ground rules. A government that is profoundly convinced that India ought to be a Hindu Rashtra, a land often for the Hindu majority. A government uh, and a ruling establishment and supporters and fellow travelers and the so-called Sangh Parivar who have thereby set about dividing Indian against Indian on the grounds of caste and creed and as a result risk bringing upon us a different kind of darkness, a darkness that would vitiate 
the, the light of freedom that has been spread across the land through our constitutional principles. We were by no means a perfect democracy. We were not a perfect society. But we were conducting ourselves through a process and a system that always offered hope for every single segment of the society that offered the prospect of change in a positive direction. That is what is being threatened by the new era of darkness. When we have a regime that tells us what we can and cannot eat, who we can and cannot love, how and we can and cannot pray, what we can and cannot believe, argue or present to the nation, then we have a fundamental challenge to those ground rules of Indian democracy that have sustained our country, our system and our hopes for seven decades. This is why the, I have gone so far as to say that the uh, forthcoming elections are not merely uh, routine general elections. They are little less than a battle for India's soul. It is a battle to restore light amid the darkness. I'm going to stop there so we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, thank you all for listening to me. Jai Yes, sir. Is there a handheld mic? Yeah. There's this gentleman in front. First of all, thank you for raising the British uh, cruelty, especially in England, uh, and talking about the era of darkness. But one of the questions, though, was what you're presenting as the GDP that we had 27%. But that, could, couldn't it be that we had a big number of people, and because of that we have a GDP, maybe our GDP per capita could be low. The second one was uh, regarding color, the problems with color or the discrimination of color. We had that before the British came, we still have it, whether if it's in the movie industry or today, uh, in any place of work. And the third one, the people in power being convicted or not, I don't know even after independence, any of the sons or the politicians who have killed people, are they being convicted? So is that a British problem or are we still having that? No, as I said, we're not a perfect democracy and I would argue that there are many, many flaws that we were in the course of correcting. I mean, for example, um, you talk about convictions, you talk about corruption, and so on and so forth. Um, one would argue that what we had as a saving grace were independent, autonomous institutions that were getting stronger over time. Uh, whether it was the Supreme Court, the judiciary, whether it was things like the Central Information Commission created just over a decade and a half ago with the, with the Right to Information Act, whether it was the, um, uh, the Fourth Estate, getting more and more independent and courageous, whether it was the uh, civil society movements, whether it was the CBI, the Reserve Bank of India, and so on. You had a number of parts of our, of our system that were not amenable to diktat from the government of the day. All of that has been eroded also in the course of these last five years. That's why I would say that even though you've rightly identified a number of flaws in the India of the last 70 years, whoever was ruling, and the Congress did rule for bulk of that time, the truth is that even that was in the process of getting better with time because of the growth and, and, and survival and strengthening of autonomous institutions. One of the most alarming things about the last um, uh, few years has been the eroding of the autonomy of these institutions. Where the Supreme Court judges come out on the lawn of the courts to protest the threats to democracy, where the Reserve Bank of India is not even consulted on demonetization and issues no fewer than 100 circulars in a month and a half, leading to people calling it the reverse bank of India rather than the reserve bank because of its reversing its positions periodically. Uh, the CBI becoming a joke with number one chasing number two and number two chasing number one and a plague on both their houses. And now states saying they will no longer refer cases to the CBI because they don't trust it anymore. The credibility is gone. Uh, and so on and so forth. Or the, the Information Commission vacancies being deliberately kept pending indefinitely by the government. So of the 11 Information Commissioners, only four have been filled and three of them are retiring within three months. So you're looking at a situation in which even the institutions that were the assurance of the checks and balances of our system are being deliberately eroded by a, I wouldn't say totalitarian government, but an attempt that a government that's attempting to be totally in control. On your first point, you're right, per capita income was not necessarily very high, but economic activity was high enough to generate high GDP. As I said, state revenues, the revenues of the emperor, came after all from the people of India. A lot of it was indeed agricultural taxes and so on, but there were also 
production, there was jewelry, there, was, there were artisans, there was, there, was, there was cloth, all sorts of things. The revenues were higher than all of the European kings together. So it wasn't exactly trivial stuff. As late as 1800, when India had slipped from 27% to 23% of global GDP, we were still second in the world. So the collapse in 23 to about three was between um, 1800 and 1947, to which apologists for the empire say, oh, but that was because uh, you missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution. I said, yeah, we missed the bus because you threw us under its wheels. You were ruling us. If we had been free, of course, we would have also imported the same kind of equipment and done the same kinds of things as European countries did. I mean, only one person invented the steam locomotive or the steam engine, but lots of countries acquired railways without going to the, to the trouble and expense of being colonized to have them, you know? And that's precisely the argument that the apologists overlook. Yes, lots of hands. Yes, ma'am. First of all, let me thank you for giving us that book. Could you hold the mic a bit closer, ma'am, to your <laughs> lips? Can you hold the mic a little closer to your lips okay, or inaudible? Okay. The hands better. Let me thank you, first of all, uh, for producing that book after the uh, Oxford debate. Uh, which gave us all the data that we were not quite so sure of, of the British atrocities. A little closer, ma'am. You're not audible at all. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, we were not, we didn't have the, uh, the data of the British atrocities that were done to India at our fingertips like you have. And I want to say thank you for bringing that data out so colorfully. Uh, thank you. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it isn't all that different what the British did to India. What about what they've done to Africa, what they have done to Australian or Aborigines, all over, or even to the Indians in uh, America or wherever. But what is worrying now, as you quite say, is um, the loss of um, democracy uh, with the present election coming on. I'm really worried that unless all these political parties join up and try to reestablish the democracy that we were so proud of before, we are depressed that we are going to, into another era of darkness in India. What is your your solution? Do you, are you hopeful? Ma'am, you know, they say sunlight is the best disinfectant. Our, our answer to darkness must be light. And one of the things we're doing in the course of this period, and certainly over the next two or three months, is to speak to the people at all levels and explain to them, enlighten them, if you wish, um, as to what the dangers are. <clears throat> On the economic side, most people know their own experience. They know what has happened. They know how a 390 rupee gas cylinder has become 970. They know they're paying more at the petrol pump, whereas in every country in the world, petrol prices have gone down. They've gone up in India because the BJP government is imposing a 20 rupee tax on every liter of petrol. I mean, people have their own experience to look at on the economy. Um, you can't keep telling people, Achedin are here, when they know that Achedin haven't come for them. So the economic argument is easier to make and will be made. But these larger dangers and threats to the kind of society within which we will overcome our problems, problems we have, what this fight is about is what kind of system will we operate in which we will actually struggle to overcome the problems. And to my mind, had Mr. Modi actually tried to fulfill his campaign promises and just use the existing system to focus on economic development and growth, he might be coasting to re-election today because he is a very compelling orator and he has all of these things going for him. The problem is that it turned out the economics was merely a smokescreen, that all this talk about sabka saat, sabka vikas, the development message, was an excuse to come to power and then unveil the real agenda, which apparently is the Hindutva agenda, of Hindu dominance, and that to a particular kind of, of, of Hindu. Certainly, I'm a, a proud Hindu, but I don't share their view of what my faith is all about. I see Hinduism as a religion of acceptance of difference. They are trying to eradicate difference in a very peculiar way of becoming like the religions they profess to dislike. But that's neither here nor there. The key issue for us, it seems to me, to answer your question, is to spread the message. First, 
vote against them on economics because they clearly don't deserve a second chance, but second, vote against them also to preserve the India in which you have grown up. If you're an adult today, you've grown up in an India in which certain freedoms were taken for granted that will be in peril if this government gets strength and power after the next elections. Yeah. So I am Sorry, we should also start moving backwards after this. After you, yeah. sir. I am from the Northeast, and I just wanted to ask you, what is your take on this, you know, slightly neither uh, light nor dark thing about NRC and the Citizenship Amendment Bill, because my state is going to, you know, riots about it. I'm from Tripura. So just like well, that. let me assure you that I think there is no question of shades of light and dark. It is completely dark. It is a betrayal of the founding premise of the nationalist movement that I summarized in my speech, because our founding premise is that religion has nothing to do with nationhood. To pass a bill that essentially says anyone is entitled to Indian citizenship unless they are Muslim is to play into the logic of Pakistan. It is really to smuggle into India the idea of Pakistan and therefore is a betrayal of the very premise of Indian nationalism. If you wanted to say that refugees and migrants, we will create a procedure whereby we can assess their claims to Indian citizenship, religion should have no part in it, no place in it. But instead, this has become an explicitly religious communal gesture aimed at a certain kind of communal polarization to benefit the ruling party for the elections. And on that ground alone, plus the betrayal of the Assam Accord and everything else, I think it deserves to be opposed. Human beings who have sought refuge in our country deserve asylum. We have a long tradition of asylum, but that should be, and there should be a formal process under which you can grant people asylum and there should be a formal way of ensuring that uh, this is done irrespective of the religious affiliation of the person. But to say that Muslims are not eligible is to my mind a betrayal of our founding constitutional compact. Yes, in the middle there, if somebody's got a mic there. And we may only have time for one more question, so the one more further rose back after you. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, it's such an honor to hear you, hear you live, sir. Thank you. So before my question, I would like to say thank you for writing books like Pax Indica. Thank it's you. It's like very, very, very honored gift to uh, youth generation like us. Thank you. So coming to my question, there is a common argument that the India now is the product of struggles by only that time INC. Is that right? What's your take in that? No, you see, the Na Indian National Congress was the nationalist, the umbrella nationalist movement. There were very, very small splinter parties who played very little role. Hindu Mahasabha, the Liberal Party of Sir Tej Bahadur Sapru, and of course the Muslim League, which went in a totally different direction. But otherwise, pretty much every Indian nationalist belonged to the Indian National Congress. Even people who subsequently founded uh, or became active in the Communist Party of India had begun their nationalist years as congressmen. Um, and the Congress remained until 1947 the only party uh, that was a vehicle for freedom. The Hindu Mahasabha collaborated. The liberals believed in constitutional means and not in agitations or protests. The Muslim League, as, as I said, wanted partition. Uh, there essentially was no that the communists, when they were uh, a distinctly organized party, supported the British because the British and the Russians were allied. So the Soviet MS. So therefore, your question was nationalism a monopoly of the Indian National Congress? It was until 1947. But after independence, of course, every party can rightly claim to be a nationalist party. We all defend our nation. We are all proud of our nation. And many of the parties that exist today split away from the Congress party. The Socialist Party and its seemingly million fragments um, were all, uh, can all trace their origins to the Congress Socialist Party of Jawaharlal Nehru. So you can look at... Um, Look at the various parties that exist in India today and say they're all nationalists. It's, but the nationalist heroes pre-47, without exception, without exception, were all congressmen. Initially, Congress motto was like, uh, they have to just, they just have, they just want to have a representation in the British government. So initially it was not like uh, they want to just throw out British from India. So is that argument right that? No, no, so initially it was very much a constitutionalist party they wrote decorous memoranda to petition the British to grant them the rights of Englishmen. And the British vertically filed them in the waste paper basket. That went on for some time. The movement then started splitting between moderates, 
and extremists. The moderates were liberal constitutionalist lawyers. The extremists were people who wanted mass movements and agitation. Mahatma Gandhi came and fused the two factions together and converted nationalism into a genuine mass movement, created in that process the Indian National Congress of the 19... 20s onwards, 20s, 30s, and 40s was a very different kind of movement where he moved away from the decorous politics of the drawing room into the politics of satyagraha, agitation, struggle, protest, and so on. So you're right. The, initially, it was constitutionalist and peaceful. It tried to work with the British, but later it moved on. And it's only because of the British betrayals that it moved in this direction. Had the British really been genuinely sincere in their professions of governing for the benefit of Indians and wanting to have progressively responsible self-government, they could easily have co-opted the Indian National Congress right up to the end of the First World War. It was instead their habit of betrayal and chicanery and cheating, their attempt to finance this alternative Muslim League in order to divide the Congress, all of that, because they feared a united nationalist movement. It was that that gave us the opportunity to transform the movement under Mahatma Gandhi. Last so question sir. would be that lady at the back, and then we must uh, wrap up. We are perilously close to the witching hour. The young girl at the back. Good morning. Good morning, sir, and it's a great privilege to have listened to you. Thank you. This is a question out of curiosity. If those merchants never landed in Surat, and if the British never got a chance to uh, colonize India, what, how would India have been today? Will we have this India, or would we, would we be saying the same things about the Portuguese or the French? <laughs> or the Dutch. Uh, there was a scramble for overseas territories from European powers, um, and, and the, the, the argument uh, that many make is that we were lucky, and that if we, were, we were going to get colonized anyway because we're relatively militarily weak and divided, and so a European power would have established itself, as the Dutch did in Indonesia, the Portuguese did in Mozambique and Goa, uh, the Belgians did in Congo, and so on. So if it wasn't the British, it would have been worse. And that's possibly true. But my, if you're going to ask me to go into counterfactual hypotheticals, it would be that, uh, the hypothetical would be, what if India had never been colonized? If no European power had dared to try and impose its, its will by force of arms, what would have happened? And there, the historical trend that was interrupted by the British was um, essentially the growing expansion of the Maratha Empire. The Marathas had spread as far south as Tanjavur. As you know, Sambar was invented in Tanjavur because the Maratha uh, ruler there, Sambhaji, was missing his dal. And so they had to invent something that would please his palate. And they actually, therefore, uh, created using ingredients that didn't exist in Maharashtra, like like tamarind and <coughs> the local dals and spices, they created sambar and named it for sambhaji. So that's, that's why we have sambar in South India, is because of the Marathas ruling us in Tanjavur. And they reached as far as Delhi, where the Mughal emperor was little more than a, a hostage of the Marathas. And though he ruled in name as Mughal emperor, and firmans were issued under his seal, it was the Marathas who were telling him what to do. They went as far east as Calcutta, where they were only stopped by the Maratha ditch dug by the British, and of course the West was already theirs. So despite the major setback at the third battle of Panipat in 1761, when Amit Shah Abdali defeated the Marathas, Abdali had no desire to stay and rule India. He conquered them, killed a few people, looted a lot, stole every precious stone he could lay his hands on, and went back to Afghanistan. If after that any Indian power had to consolidate, it would have been the Marathas. And if I were to look at world history and the history of comparable nations, you would have seen the Marathas controlling the whole subcontinent. It would have initially been a very militarized rule, but in order to rule such a large country, they would have had decentralized sort of mini Peshwas around the place. Like Sambhaji in Tanjavur, there would have been people in 2025 20, parts of the country owing allegiance to a central sort of Maratha prime minister who in turn would be giving orders to the Mughal emperor in whose name everything would be done. Rather like the Japanese shogunate, you'd have had a situation where you have a symbolic monarch who's, who's essentially a constitutional monarch in the sense that he would have no real power. You'd have a strongly militarized system underneath it, the Marathas playing the roles of the shoguns. And then inevitably, as happened everywhere in the world, including Japan, increasing democratization would come. By the 19th century, this rich and prosperous and strong, because militarily strong country, would be importing rail lines, would be importing factories, 
and you would have had um, India not divided, but as I say, with a Muslim constitutional monarch and, uh, and, and a Hindu Maratha empire beneath it. They were in a much more syncretism throughout the society. People of all faiths would have worked together. Shivaji, the great Maratha king, famously said to his soldiers that if you ever, after a battle, come across a Quran, you will treat it with respect until you can find a Muslim to give it to. That was his order to his troops. And that kind of situation would have developed uh, throughout the country. And I think India would have been a great constitutional democracy um, uh, on the sort of Japanese model, if you like, by the middle of the 20th century. So that's my counterfactual hypothetical. Maybe it wouldn't have happened, but uh, we know it didn't happen because instead we got the era of darkness. Thank you all very much, Jay. And have a wonderful festival. You've got four great days ahead.